wow, this is a big area. So um, I'm, my talk's going to really lead really well on from Laura's. And this whole session, there's a series of talks that will lead on from each, each of them very well. Um, I'm actually going to look at reproductive phenology and recruitment in populations of temperate Polstone australis. And I'm going to be looking at natural rates of recruitment. And we specifically do this work because we're interested in using seeds as our source for restoration in the system. <coughs> and um, as we all know, there's, well, let's not argue over it, but there's about 72 species of seagrass globally, if we take Fred's um, uh, red list. Um, and we spend a lot of time understanding the function of the uh, ramet in space, um, and we don't spend a lot of time working uh, really specifically on genets. So we go out and we measure the, uh, the growth of the ramets inside seagrass meadows. But today what I'd like to really focus on is on uh, the reproduction and the outputs from reproduction in terms of recruitment. So this is just a, uh, a summary of the diversity of uh, reproduction and the seeds or, or in, if vivipara seedlings produced from reproduction across a multitude of um, species. So here we go. Amphibus Antarctica and Thalassodendron produce these viviparous um, seedlings. Um, Postonia australis uh, has this fleshy seed coat. There's uh, very little, uh, there's no dormancy and the seed comes out red, um, basically uh, growing, but Thalassia and Halus do that as well. Uh, Halophila ovalis and Zostra are classic examples of hard seed coats with distinct dormancies, as we've heard from the previous talk. Um, and uh, in the tropics, Cymodocea and Halidulia do the same. Um, so that's what they produce. Can we use these in restoration? What sort of primary information do we need before we can actually use them? One of the first things we need to know is to understand the natural rates of flowering, seed production and recruitment. Today I'll focus on Rottnest Island. And Rottnest Island I'll be focusing on the south side of the island, Parker Point, Nancy Cove. And on the north side, Stark Bay and Thompson's Bay, we've been uh, measuring flowering and uh, fruiting in this area over the last four or five years continuously. But over 14 years, we have data, set, uh, data points where we're looking at uh, flowering and fruiting from about eight locations around the island. Um, and this is just a fun slide to show you. Sometimes it's actually the seagrass meadows are almost to the surface um, for us. Posidonia is a subtitle species, so this is actually as close as we get to intertidal. Um, and the flowers are really interesting. They're uh, um, basically hermaphroditic uh, um, flowers, and these are the anthers, and here is your, um, your, your stigma up there for the female flower. They're uh, protagonists in that you've got the production of uh, anthers and uh, pollen before the flowers actually maturate. And this seems to be a strategy that's quite different from Zostra, because it's the opposite, prot protandrous. Um, and it uh, reduces the uh, opportunity for selfing, basically, in the population. Um, and just to give you an idea of the densities of flower production, this is 213 to 216. I was meant to put 270 on here, but I'm lazy, and I never got around to doing it over the last two days. But it doesn't change. So the south side of the island, which is Nancy Cove and Parker Point, there are very low rates of flower production per square metre. Around about your 100 is, is a maximum per square metre, whereas in Stark Bay and Thompson's Bay East, to the north and northeast of the, uh, off the island, uh, production is quite dramatically greater in the hundreds, 500 to over 1,000 flowers per square metre in the meadows. Um, they don't, doesn't mean that all the meadow flowers, they, they are actually quite spatially patchy within the meadows, but where they are, those are the densities. The, uh, also, as well as the south versus the north side pattern, I'd just like to, you to keep your eye on 2015, which was a good year for fruit production around the island and it'll show up in 2016 in recruits. Um, the other interesting thing, and I was thinking about this, um, there's actually a higher clonality, or the clones are larger, and, f and there is 
less genetic diversity on the south side of the island than the north side of the island. And that sort of correlation between flowering and clonality is interesting. It's only a correlation right now. I, I'm not inferring any causality. Now these are the fruit of Posidonia. They're quite large, about two centimetres in length, and they're, uh, they're buoyant. They float to the surface. They do not split uh, predominantly on the plant. You do get some splittage and, and some seeds will fall where they produce, but many of them actually float to the surface. Inside that fruit is a single seed, and as I said before, they're direct developers. Here's the, the proto-root and the proto-shoot um, shoot developing straight out of the seed. And look at the size of them. They're about a centimetre in size. So quite different than the zostra seeds. Um, if you look at fruit production, or, or in this case seed production, it's the same because it's the same number. One seed equals one fruit. Um, what we see is about 40, 20 to 40 um, seeds are produced in the south side of the island per square metre versus in the north side of the island, the numbers are highly variable. They can be at less than, a, less than a, uh, 200 or greater than, in some instances, over 700 seeds. And these two sites, the highest we got was about 550 to 580 on average. Um, and notice the higher fruit, pro uh, fruit production in 2015. So what this sort of says is a highly variable system, even where you, where you have a lot of flowering going on. So every year is slightly different. What happens to the, the fruit? They float to the surface. And this is just to remind me, to, to, um, just to say that yeah, many of these fruit actually move outside of the base they're produced in and they can move as far as 70, 80 kilometres. Um, and, uh, but that's extreme rare events. Most of them actually settle within tens to hundreds of metres of their production. And what happens? Hundreds of, of fruit um, dehiss, drop seeds. Seeds are in tens to hundreds per square metre on the bottom, especially in the sandy areas around the seagrass meadow. Very hard to study within a seagrass meadow. And this is just one-year-old seedlings a year later. The really cool thing about this photo is, firstly, the density of the seeds, but also you can see within a year they actually branch the first time. So for Postonia australis, they can go through one or two branches every year. So you can have two shoots or four shoots by the end of that year. Um, usually by November, when they're flowering again, it's only the first branch in time. And if you look at the number of seed seedlings per square metre in 300 square metre regions of sand around seagrass meadows, you find the densities are dramatically reduced from the, the production. And um, the, uh, here again, we've had no recruitment into Nancy Cove over the last five years. So Nancy Cove, it's got a lot of clonality. It does produce some flowers and some fruit but it doesn't look like anything survives for a year within that system. Whereas uh, to the south, Parker Point's slightly different, um, and we actually have quite a few number of seedlings, about one per square metre in that system. And similarly, the other thing to point out is this growth in uh, one-year-old recruits a year after the production of a high production of seeds in the system. So what happens after one year? You know, okay, they survive. What happens? Well, age structure recruits. I'm going to quickly go through this. There was 280 recruits um, measured in 300 square metres off the bottom at Parker Point. And these are areas that are disturbed seasonally by winter storms and summer boat anchoring. So these are not controlled environments. Um, and what we see is a preponderance of that first year recruitment, but still for the second year, so one and two, sorry, zero, yeah, one and two is actually one year, two to four is the second year of growth, and so forth and so forth. So just halve those numbers and you get years. 60% um, of the 280 seeds are actually from the last year's seeding. But 10% survive in this, into the second year, and 10% survive into the third year, and 5% survive in the fourth year, and so forth. So 
Um, despite very, very high losses, you still end up with individuals in a population. And the point I want to make with that one is different site, north side of the island, Stark Bay. What, what do you see here? More survivorship into those later cohorts. And if you look at the photos, um, I've only measured out to four years here, but I've actually got individuals that keep going. I don't know how old they are because, you know, you really can't figure that out from branching rates. But um, these are individuals uh, that now exist in Stark Bay over the last four years. And you can see straight away you've got uh, the growth of really a multi-species uh, assemblage around these nucleation points, which are actually recruits to postoma. So, in, in, uh, to wrap this up, uh, good timing, <laughs> um, recruitment from seeds do play a role in resilience in Postonia australis naturally, um, and annual flowering is prodigious. We're producing 100,000 to a million plus seeds per bay at Rottnest Island, and if anybody's been to Rottnest Island, the bays can be as small as this room or ten times the size of this room. They're quite small. There's a really a big loss between the seed and the three to four year old recruits. It's an expen exponential loss, much like um, has already been described. Um, and, you know, we really only end up with a few, uh, you know, one individual four years later from that prodigious seeding um, of, the, of the first year. So, of course, this is great news for Rottnest Island. It's, we're getting a lot of genotypic diversity, especially on the north side of the island. Um, but not at all meadows, and Nancy Clove is the classic example on the south side of the island where we're not getting any seed recruitment in it. And uh, on that note, I'd just like to thank a whole pile of um, um, co colleagues and um, investors in this work. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot, Gary. Very, very interesting. Are there any questions? Just, I think we have time for only one question. Well, just, oh, you got one, good, because yeah, I could make, get, get my own question if you want me to. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Um, I was interested with your Parker Point example, because you showed earlier that you didn't have flowering, and I don't think there was much fruiting either, About but then you had 40, pretty, yeah. pretty good seed establishment. Is that coming in from outside, or is it actually within that bay, and it's uh, just more survivorship? The one thing I haven't talked about is seed movement, and Parker Point acts as a bit of a sink. It, it has a tendency to hold things in it, so it has more success in terms of seed settling on the bottom locally. And uh, we don't have the genetics yet, but the... Uh oh, that's broken. Um, uh, but the, uh, the hydrodynamic models show that. Okay. Well, thanks.